All right, now in Mark chapter 3, here of course is a lot of things, but I'm going to be focusing more on this on um, these parables that Jesus was talking about um, with Satan being divi divided against Satan. And if you notice there, it says in verse 29, but he that shall blaspheme against the Holy Ghost hath never forgiveness. There's a danger of eternal damnation. What I'm going to be preaching about tonight, and what I'm really going to be teaching tonight, it's going to be a lot more teaching, is, is the unforgivable sins that are found in the Bible. And um, these are unpardonable, unforgivable sins. Or really the very first one we're going to look at here is blaspheming the Holy Ghost. And it says, it says right there in, you know, in black and white or in red and white, depending on your Bible, it says that he, shall, um, he that shall blaspheme against the Holy Ghost hath never forgiveness. So if you blaspheme against the Holy Ghost, you never have forgiveness. And keep your finger here in Mark 3 because we're going to come back to that. We're going to see basically the same thing in Luke 12. Okay? And we're going to turn to, to all the, these. There's a few different things that can be done where a person can be beyond forgiveness. Now, I'm going to state this at the beginning. I'll probably keep repeating myself throughout the sermon. Obviously, we believe that once a person is saved, you're, you have eternal life. You can never lose that salvation for any reason. You are eternally um, secured. You're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. God seals you. He, he saves you. All of your sins are forgiven. Okay, these are things that people can do before they get saved. All these things we're going to go over, basically. I'm going to explain a little bit more about that later. But essentially, everything that we're looking at tonight, say, hey, look, if you do this, you never have forgiveness. These are things that people can do. These are, these are lines that people can, can cross with God, so to speak, where he's going to say, okay, now you can't get saved. See, everybody starts off having this opportunity to get saved. I mean, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Christ died for everybody on the cross. Absolutely everybody. But there are some things that we're going to dig into this, certain things that people can do where God just says, uh-uh, no, now you, now you can't get saved. And he, and he hardens people's hearts. And we're going to see a little bit about that. But let's, um, if you're in, keep your finger in Mark 3, flip back to Luke chapter 12, or forward to Luke chapter 12. We're going to first cover this idea of blaspheming the Holy Ghost. Luke 12, 8 says, Also I say unto you, Whosoever shall confess me before men, him shall the Son of Man also confess before the angels. But he that denieth me before men shall be denied before the angels of God. And whosoever shall speak a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But unto him that blasphemeth against the Holy Ghost, it shall not, it shall not be forgiven. Now, I think it's important just to cover this stuff tonight because there's a lot of things in the Bible where people just get, it's just confusing. You say, well, how can that be? How can there's something that could be that's unforgivable? And we're, we're going to explain I mean, we see it, you know, if it was just maybe this one verse in Luke 12, you might kind of figure out a way to say, oh, well, it doesn't mean that they can never, ever be forgiven, you know. It just means he's real serious about something, but that's not the case. The Bible says, look, if you blaspheme against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven. Now, you might be asking yourself, what does that even mean? What does it mean to blaspheme the Holy Ghost? Because he even says right here, he says, look, whosoever shall speak a word against the Son of Man, so if you, if you, you know, blaspheme Jesus, he's not saying that that's an unforgivable sin, but he said, but unto him that blasphemeth against the Holy Ghost, it shall be forgiven. So it's, it's kind of interesting. Flip back to, to Mark 3 where we were, because Mark 3 gives us a lot more um, details about what this what this is talking about, about blaspheming the Holy Ghost. Now, we start off with this parable in verse number 22. Right before he tells them this parable, it says, And the scribes which came down from Jerusalem said, He hath Beelzebub, and by the prince of the devils casteth he out devils. So basically, they're looking at Jesus Christ and they're saying, because he's, he's casting out devils, and it's apparent. He's obviously doing it. I mean, there are people coming to him, and they're possessed with devils, and Jesus is casting them out with authority. He's, he's just saying, you know, get out of them, and, and he's making these people, you know, not possessed anymore. And it's apparent. And these people that see it, instead of saying, wow, this must be of God, which would probably be a more normal response of someone, you know, casting out demons, casting out devils, they say, well, no. He actually has Beelzebub, right? Beelzebub is just another name for Satan. 
he has Satan. He's basically, what he's doing is up Satan by the prince of the devils cast at the out devils. They're saying, well, the only reason he's even able to cast him out is because he's like higher in authority. He's a, he's a, he's a more powerful devil than them, and they're just listening to him when he casts him out. And it's important to realize that, like, what these people are actually saying. I mean, they're, they're looking at Jesus Christ. They're at the time when Jesus Christ is physically walking around on this earth. They get to see the miracles that he performs. I mean, it's, it's a pretty amazing thing. You don't, we don't see miracles today just happening all the time, especially around a person where he's able to you know, heal this blind man, make this person walk. Do, I mean, he's doing this stuff a lot. A, I mean, the Bible says that you know, if, if books were to be written on, basically on, on, on all the things that he did, there's not enough, you know, the world couldn't contain all the books that would be written for the things that Jesus Christ did for the, just his three and a half years of ministry on this earth. That, that amount of time, the short amount of time, he did so much work and so many things, healed so many people, performed so many miracles. It's kind of like, you're going to see that. You're going to witness this. You're going to hear him preach, and you're going to say, that's of the devil. That's what they're doing when it says he blasphemes the Holy Ghost. That's what it says in, um, in verse 29, or verse 28, jump down. It says, Verily I say unto you, all sins shall be forgiven unto the sons of men, and blasphemies wherewith soever they shall blaspheme. But he that shall blaspheme against the Holy Ghost hath never forgiveness, but is in danger of eternal damnation. Now there's a colon there at the end of verse 29. The sentence is not over yet. Verse 30 explains, it says, Because they said, he hath an unclean spirit. Talking about Jesus Christ. So that was the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost is by saying that Jesus Christ himself had an unclean spirit inside of him, saying that Jesus Christ is of the devil. So people saying that Jesus Christ, basically his power, he is the devil, he's of the devil, they're blaspheming the Holy Ghost when he said that. Now, honestly, I don't know if this is a sin that can be committed today just because of the way that he said it. It's, it's when they said that Jesus Christ had a devil, I think, again, I think a lot of that has to do with him performing all these miracles right in front of their eyes and just to say, hey, that's of the devil. That's a pretty, it's a pretty serious thing to say. It's a pretty bold statement to make, um, being confronted with all of this miraculous evidence that Jesus Christ was doing for them, but, um, and scriptural evidence. Besides just seeing the things that they can see through miracles, all the prophecies, all the, the words that he spake, the wisdom that he had, how close he, I mean, how much he knew the Bible and was able to just expound it on the people, you know, all of these things have... have Way so, you know, so much support to, to just believe Jesus when he was here on this earth. To say that he was of the devil, they ended up blaspheming the Holy Ghost. And Jesus explains to him, he says, look, how can Satan cast out Satan? He says, if a kingdom be divided against itself, that kingdom can't stand. And if a house be divided against itself, the house cannot stand. And if Satan rise up against himself and be divided, he cannot stand. But at the end, he's saying, look, if I am of the devil, I'm casting out devils. That doesn't even make any sense. He's like, you know, I'm not going to be casting out the, the, the supposedly the devils that would be working for me. You know, I mean, this doesn't make any sense at all. If there's just this conflict and he's, and, and the people are supposedly in league with him, they're just fighting against each other. He says, that house can't stand. And um, so he explains all this stuff here. And then um, turn, if you would, to Matthew chapter 12. We'll see the, the other reference for this in the Gospels, where, where Jesus Christ says, I mean, in Luke he said, um, but unto him that blasphemeth against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven. And in Mark 3, it says, he that shall blaspheme against the Holy Ghost hath never forgiveness. So that's even a little bit more clear than it was in Mark as well, because it says it shall not be forgiven. It's like, well, ever or not, you know, it shall not be forgiven. In Mark 3, it makes it clear. It says he hath never forgiveness. I mean, this is something that people can do. It says, look, you, have, you never will have forgiveness for that. Everything else you get forgiveness for. But he says, this you won't get forgiveness for. And then it says um, in Matthew chapter 12, verse 24, again it says, we see, but uh, verse 24, Matthew 12, but when the Pharisees heard it, they said, this fellow doth not cast out devils, but by Beelzebub, the prince of the devils. What we just saw in Mark 3. It says, and Jesus knew their thoughts and said unto them, every kingdom divided against itself, is brought to desolation, and every city or house divided against itself cannot, shall not stand. And if Satan cast out Satan, he is divided against himself. How shall then his kingdom stand? And if I by Beelzebub cast out devils, by whom do your children cast them out? 
Therefore, they shall be your judges. So he's saying, look, if you think I'm, you know, using the power of Beelzebub to cast out these devils, what about your children who are casting out devils? You know, what about these people that are casting out devils? He's like, um, you know, they're not going to say that that's, they're the Satan too, you know. And then um, he says, therefore, they're going to be your judges. Verse 28, but if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come unto you. Or else, how can one enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods, except he first bind the strong man, and then he will spoil his house? He that is not with me is against me, and he that gathereth not with me scattereth abroad. Wherefore I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men, but the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. Three places in Scripture here in, in these three in the three accounts of the Gospel, he's saying clearly that this blasphemy against the Holy Ghost cannot be forgiven, and there's no way around this. There's no way to say that that's not what that means or whatever. Um, it's it's clear. Let's keep reading here in, in, in Matthew 12. Look at verse 32. It says, And whosoever speaketh the word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him. Neither in this world, again, neither in the world to come. So he's making it abundantly clear. And we're seeing these little bits and pieces from each of the accounts that make it more clear. You know, um, Mark's the one that says he hath never forgiveness. So he's never going to be forgiven. Now here in Matthew, we see that it's, um, it shall not be forgiven him. Not in this world or in the world to come. I mean, that's that's never forgiven. I mean, that's 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 serious. And then look at verse 33. It says, either make the tree good and its fruit good, or else make the tree corrupt and its fruit corrupt. For the tree is known by its fruit. O generation of vipers, how can ye being evil speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh. A good man out of the good treasure of the heart bringeth forth good things. And an evil man, out of the evil treasure, bringeth forth evil things. But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, get this, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. Take heed to your words, they're important. The Bible says, you know, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Those are the words that are going to save you. Calling on Jesus. Believing in your heart that God raised him from the dead. Blaspheming the Holy Ghost is going to damn you. People, if, you, if you're going to say that Jesus Christ is of the devil, that's pretty bad. And that, I mean, that's, that's what he was doing here. And God has a line that he's drawn. He just said, no. If you do this, I will not forgive that. Now, again, as I mentioned earlier, I don't know if this is something that, that can literally be done today with Jesus not physically walking around. I don't know, but that's not something that I'd want to try. And I'll tell you what, with this, with people that, that just can't be forgiven, they're called reprobates. And that's going to be my last point um, in this sermon where we're going to go to Romans 1, where Romans 1 really explains a lot about people who are reprobate or rejected. That word reprobate simply just means rejected. God has rejected them. And... You know, you hear it and it sounds good. Where it says, you always have a chance to get saved. Everyone always has a chance to get saved all the way up until the moment they die. That's not true. If someone blasphemes the Holy Ghost, they do not have an opportunity to get saved anymore. So they have never, never forgiveness. The only way we get into heaven is if all of our sins are forgiven. They have to be forgiven. Otherwise, we have a debt that we owe that we have to pay for in hell. And if we can't be forgiven of the sin, then you have to pay for it yourself. Now... I do not believe that it is possible, I'm going to get into this a little bit later, I'm kind of jumping ahead of myself, I do not believe it's possible for someone who's already saved to do this sin. I think it's simply not possible at all. You have the Holy Spirit residing inside of you. I do not think it's possible for, for someone who's already saved and received Christ as their Savior to blaspheme the Holy Ghost the way it's talking about here. I don't think it's possible. I'll get into that a little bit later. But let's see the second thing. Turn to Revelation 14. So we see blasphemy against the Holy Ghost. There's a lot of people have questions about this too. I, even out soul winning, you know, I'll be talking to people and they bring it, but they bring this up. Like, what, is it, what does it mean to blaspheme the Holy Ghost? What, you know, why does it say it's an unforgivable sin? And it's because it is. It is an unforgivable sin. And someone who does that, you know, they're, they're a child of the devil. Just like when you get saved, when you put your faith in Christ, you become a child of God. You're born again. 
Well, Jesus Christ oftentimes is rebuking the Pharisees and these false prophets, and he calls them children of the devil. I believe that once a person, you know, when you start off, you're not a child of God or a child of the devil, right? I mean, you're just, you're just a regular person, you're a sinner. You know, it's not like you've blasphemed the Holy Ghost. It's not like you've gone the way of Satan and just, and just completely become reprobate by God. But at the same time, you know, you might not have, have gotten saved yet either. So you're, you're just, I mean, you're just an average sinner. You're not born again either way, right? But there comes a point in people's life where they could obviously believe on Christ. They're born again. They're born into God's family when they do that. When they accept Christ as their Savior, hey, they're born again. But there's also points where people can get to when they reject God, and we'll see more of that in Romans 1, or, or do one of these other sins that we're going to list here, where they're, born, they're going to be a child of the devil. And, and, that's, and that's it for them. Just the same way that's it for you. Once you're born again and born into God's family, you can't, I mean, he's not, there's no way you can change that. There's no way you can change the fact that my daughters and my daughters, once you're born a child of God, hey, you're always going to be a child of God, but once you're a child of the devil, it works the same way. Look at Revelation 14, look at verse number 9. This is the second thing that we're going to see that, that damns you to hell eternally. That if, if, if the people that do this thing, it's, it's written in the Bible, it's written in God's word that this will happen. Revelation 14, look at verse number 9. It says, And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone, in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night who worship the beast in his image and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. If you receive the mark of the beast, the Bible says right here, you are going to burn in the lake of fire and brimstone. That's it. It's, it's a sealed deal. You're, it's 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 going to happen. It says again, verse number nine or verse number ten. It says in verse nine, it says, "If any man worship the beast in his image, and receive his mark as far as his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God." Um, and it says a little bit later in that verse, "And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels in the presence of the Lamb." That's what's going to happen to every single person that takes the mark of the beast. Now I forgot who it was. There's some like John MacArthur or one of these other guys just came out recently saying, oh yeah, you know, people in the tribulation, if they, you know, if they take the mark of the beast, they can still get saved. That's contrary to what the Bible says right here in Revelation 14.9. It's impossible to get saved. If the Bible says that if you take the mark of the beast, you're going to burn in the lake of fire and brimstone, and that's what's going to happen. I mean, there's no way around it. You, in order to, you, you can't make an excuse for this by taking from the Bible for what it says at face value. There's no way you can do that. But again, we're going to see in a little bit how that's, a Christian is not going to do that. Someone who's already saved will not do that. The third thing you can do in Revelation 14, flip over to chapter 22. They're the last chapter of the Bible. Revelation 22, right near the end of the Bible. Right at the end of the Bible. Revelation 22, we're going to see the third thing that someone can do to where they're beyond forgiveness. They're damned. Their fate is sealed. And, and not in a good way. The fate is sealed negatively. Revelation 22, look at verse 18. It says, For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book. If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. So he's saying, look, if you tamper with God's word, if you go in and you have the, the holy scriptures that were given to us and passed out, he said, if you go in and you're going to change God's word, if you're going to start taking things away and adding things in, he says, your, your part is out of the book of life. You cannot get saved. Your name will not be found in that book of life. You will not go to heaven. And we use this out soul winning in... Um, Revelation chapter 20, the Bible says that the, the, the last verse, verse 15, and whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. If your name's not in the book of life, you're going in the lake of fire. Bottom line. 
And it says here, if you add from or take away from God's word, your name will not be found in the book of life. You will burn in hell forever. So these people, all the, all these, you know, these translators, so called, that get together and they, they you know, that, that put out the NIV and the ESV and all these other corruptions of God's word. When they start looking at God's at the Scripture and saying, "Oh no, we don't need that. Oh, we're going to add this in here." That's scary, my friends. That, those people are damned to hell forever. There's nothing they can do to change that now. If they're if these people have participated and have physically translated and have been part of the removing of God's word. It doesn't matter if they're still alive on this earth. They cannot get saved. They are beyond redemption. They cannot get saved. They have never forgiven us. The Bible clearly says that, that they will go to the lake of fire. Their, their, book, their name is not going to be found in the book of life. Now the fourth thing and the last thing this is a shorter sermon tonight. Turn to Romans chapter 1. Now look, for the vast majority of the people, I still think that, yeah, they're probably able to get saved just about up till death, okay? These sins that I mentioned are not common sins. I mean, this isn't you steal, oh, you've crossed the line with God. You murder, you've crossed the line with God. No. None of these things are like that at all. They're, they're very spiritual in nature, first of all. I mean, blaspheming the Holy Ghost, like, why would it even come into your heart to, to, to hate Jesus so much to just say like that he's of the devil. That's a pretty serious thing to do. I mean, there was, there was 20 years of my life where I was unsaved. I never would have dreamed of, of, of saying something like that or doing something like that. I think you have to get to a point where you just pretty much hate God and you, and you hate what he's all about in order, in order to, to commit such a thing of blaspheming the Holy Ghost like that and just saying Jesus is of Satan. That's a... I mean, that's a pretty serious thing. Taking the mark of the beast. Okay, now obviously we don't know exactly how that's going to be, but the Antichrist is going to come, he's going to set up his dominion power, and, and he's going to be, a, I mean, he's anti-Christ, he's against Christ, he's anti-God, he's, he's putting himself as if he's God, so people who are going to claim him as, as their God and, and worship him and take his mark and take, you know, receive that, hey, they've made their choice, they become children of the devil. They've taken the mark of the beast, and again, I mean, that's obviously that's not uh, that's not happening today. The the mark of the beast isn't available to us yet today. We don't know when that's going to happen, but when the antichrist is revealed and he standeth where he ought not in the, in the holy temple, proclaiming himself that he is God, then yeah, we're going to see we're going to see what the mark of the beast is all about. And then, of course, the third thing, tampering with the Bible. Most people don't have it in their hearts to go and just start messing with the Bible. I mean. If you're not saved, a lot of people, they, they either read the Bible or they don't care about it or whatever, but you're not going to be going in there and like, like saying, no, we're going to change this. We're going to change what the Bible says to say something completely different. So again, you know, these three things we saw, this is not something that just affects like a, a large percentage of the population. There's going to be very, very few people that, are, that fall into these categories. But then the fourth one, Romans 1, this, is, this probably encompasses a lot more than any of the other three. Turn to Romans 1. Because this is ultimately just like an ultimate rejection of God after hearing about Him, after understanding what salvation is, after knowing about Him, and just completely just saying, nope, I want nothing to do with Him. Romans chapter 1, where basically people change the truth of God into a lie. Which, ultimately, that's what you're doing when you're tampering with the Bible. When you're changing God's Word, you have the truth of God. You have the truth in the Scripture. When you, when you take away and you add to it, now all of a sudden you're making it a lie because those aren't God's words. That's not what God said. That's not what God has in his scripture for us when you start making your, your changes to his word. Look at Romans 1. Look at verse number 18. The Bible says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness because that which may be known of God is manifest in them for God hath showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, and so that, so that they are without excuse. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. 
professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Wherefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Now, in Romans chapter 1 here in this section, um, if you keep reading, basically there's three times that it says that God has rejected these people. It says in, um, in verse 24, it says, wherefore, meaning because of this, because of the verse that I listed earlier, God also gave them up. Now, he gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts and the sign of their own minds between themselves. And then it says in, um, I don't have these all highlighted. It's 26, it says, for this cause God gave them up unto vile affections, for even the women to change natural use into that which is against nature. And in verse 28 kind of sums it up. It says, And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. And then it lists off all of these horrible just attributes and sins that, that, that describe people who are rejected. God gave them over to a reprobate mind. It says, Because they did not want to retain God in their knowledge, they wanted nothing to do with God. Now look, Again, this isn't your average sinner. This isn't your average person out there. These are people who, they've heard about God. They've heard about Jesus Christ. They heard about his love. They heard about what he did for them when he died on the cross. They know that they're sinners. They're without excuse. Okay? These people don't have any, any, any excuse to say, oh, well, I didn't know. Oh, well, I, you know, I didn't have a chance to believe. No, they don't have that excuse. They've heard about Jesus Christ. They, they knew God. It says they knew God in verse 21 because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God. They knew who God was. This isn't something that, oh, I didn't even know who God was. No, they knew. They knew God, but they glorified him not as God. Neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. So they decided to make up their own gods. These are people that, uh, yeah. I know that God. I know the God of the Bible. I don't like that God. I don't want anything to do with that God. That God's mean or whatever these people say these days. So I'm going to make up my own God. And they, they, they have these idols and they worship the creature who is more than, you know, more than the creator. Um, that's why they make these idols, these images that are like birds and four-footed beasts. And honestly, a lot of these people, that's where you get a lot of the... Um, like the mother, the mother nature type of worship, people who just worship the planet and they worship the animals and they actually esteem animals like, like better than human beings. I mean, people get pretty nuts with this. And I'm not saying every single one of them is reprobate, but the ones who are reprobate really get into this where, where they just have this bizarre warped sense of value and, and they, they value the things that God has created instead of God himself. And um, it's for this reason... That's why God has gave them up and he gave them over to a reprobate mind. And he says, look, you don't want to know about me. You, you, you've understood. You've heard about me. You don't want to have anything to do with me. Well, then I'm not going to have anything to do with you. And we know from the Bible that God is very long-suffering, very merciful. He, he extends lots of grace and lots of mercy and, and anyone here I know I can attest to this personally in my life and I'm sure many others here can probably do the same before you get saved like man I did all these sins I was doing all these things wrong but God still was merciful and long suffering and I was still able to, to find grace and I was still able to get saved look he has an extreme amount of mercy so people who get to this point and they still understand God they still just say nope don't want to have anything to do with you God just says, fine. You've got a reprobate mind now. And it's important to understand this too because people misunderstand this point. People will think that, um, oh, they'll say, oh, so if you commit sodomy, then, then you, know, you can't be saved. No, that's not what I believe. It's not, it's not that the sin of homosexuality, the sin of sodomy, is what makes you no longer to be to become unsaved. 
Because the Bible doesn't say that anywhere. It doesn't say that that sin will, will prevent you from being saved. But what I do believe is that that is just a symptom of a person already being rejected by God. See, they didn't glorify God they, when they knew God. That is what got them rejected. They became vain in their imaginations. Their foolish heart became darkened. Before they ever became a sodomite, before they ever you know, became a queer, they decided, I heard God and I want nothing to do with Him. They completely rejected God, rejected anything that they wanted to have to do with Him, or they tampered with God's Word or whatever, and they became a reprobate. And they became rejected. And at that point, that's when God is just giving them over. So it's basically just unrestrained wickedness of the heart that's going to come out. And it manifests itself, as you see here, in um, the uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. It says in, um, in verse 26, For this cause God gave them up unto vile affections, for even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another, men with men, working that which is unseemly, and receiving themselves that recompense of their error which was meet. So we see here that it's because God gave them over the reprobate right mind is why they even ever became a homosexual to begin with. Why did they even, you know, they were given up under vile affection. The Bible calls it vile, okay? It doesn't say that it's an alternative lifestyle. It doesn't say, oh, just accept this because it's normal, it's fine, and that's just what they do. Maybe you do something different, but whatever, don't worry about what they're doing. No, the Bible says it's vile. Those are vile affections. It's nasty, it's disgusting when you have two men or two women doing things together that they ought not do. They've been given up unto that reprobate mind to do those vile affections and do those things that are not convenient. So it says, for even the women to change the natural use into that which is against nature. The nature that God has created us with. The nature that you're born with. Yes, we have a sinful nature. Well, that's against, that's against even the sinful nature that you have when you're born. You have, you, you know, it's it might be natural to tell a lie. It might be natural to steal something, right? It's natural to do all these other sins. But laying with another man or another woman, you know, a person of the same gender, that is not a natural thing to do whatsoever. It is completely unnatural to do that. That's why you've had for, for years and years and years, and when I was growing up, I mean, tons of people who are unsaved, when you see, if, if you ever even came across your, your eyes of like two men kissing or something, you're repulsed. It's disgusting. It's vile. You look at that and say, ugh, like, what are you doing? That's nasty. Even in an unsaved world, that's, that's nasty. But I mean, it's changing these days, and, and the devil's just really hitting his heart, and, and his vocal minority is trying to get you to accept it. And it's not. It's wickedness. It's vile. And they're reprobate. And they're not reprobate because they committed that act. They're reprobate because they've already rejected God. And then God removed the, the, the reins from off of their hearts, the, the conscience that you, you, know, you could call it, you know, something that, that, that you have instilled in you even before you're saved that kind of prevents you from doing, from doing things. And this is the reason why we have people who have then just, just gotten further and further down the downward spiral of, of wickedness when you have perverts like child molesters and, and, and cannibalists and rape, you know, I mean, pe people doing horrible things that, that you couldn't even imagine in, in your worst nightmare that you would ever come up with on your own. People come up with this stuff because they've already been rejected by God. It's it. It's already. They've already just been saying, "Okay, you're done. I've had enough of you." And this is why people get to that point. Now, I don't like preaching on this subject. I don't think I'm going to preach on this again for a while because it's it's not. I mean, it's not a pleasant thing. But we need to understand that there are certain sins here that people can do, and things that people can do to to secure to to secure their own damnation. Whether it be blaspheming the Holy Ghost, changing God's word, you know, just utterly rejecting God, changing the truth of God into a lie, or taking the mark of the beast, all of these things, the Bible is very clear about this, saying, look, if you do these things, you're, you're going to hell. And that's it. And you don't have forgiveness. There's not a second chance on these things. You've already had the, you know, the opportunity to get saved. Now, All these various things, these four things that we kind of covered, can be done to secure a place in hell. But there's only one thing that must be done to secure a place in heaven, as you mentioned earlier. 
And that's like in Acts 16, 30 through 1. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. John 5, 24. Uh, Verily I say unto you, you that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me, hath everlasting life, and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. Right there alone. I mean, there's a promise from Jesus Christ. He says, look, if you believe in me, you have everlasting life. You shall not come into condemnation. So this is where people come up with the, here's the big question then, right? Say, okay, I put my faith in Christ. He promised me I shall not come into condemnation. But now what happens if I do one of these things? Because the Bible is very clear. It says, well, if you do these things, you're going to lake of fire. So which is it? Right? That's a, that's a great question. Which is it? Well, if that were even possible, if it's possible, then you have a contradiction in the Bible. Hands down. You have a contradiction. Because how can you, how can you do something that's going to damn you forever and have everlasting life that can't ever be taken away from you at the same time? There's no way, there's no way that the two, that two can, can mesh together. So, for, one, I mean, for that reason alone, just, just for, the, for the consistency sake of the Bible, knowing that it's God's Word and there are no um, contradictions in the Bible, I don't, it's not possible for someone who's already saved to, to do these things. But here's, I'll give you some scriptures here that I found um, that can maybe help, help us understand and, and give us a little bit more proof as to saying that, you know, you a Christian won't do that, a saved person won't do these things. Um, John, well, a few more verses I guess I had here on, on you know, John 6.35 says, And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life, he that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. Again, similar to John 5.24, saying, look, you're never going to hunger, you're never going to thirst if you believe on him. Now, I think if you get cast in a lake of fire, you're going to thirst, right? But he's saying, if, you know, he that believeth on me shall never thirst. But I said unto you, um, that ye also have seen me and believe not. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and, it, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. So there's Jesus again. He's promising that I'm not going to cast you out. I won't do it. John 6, 38 says, For I came down from heaven not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. And this is the Father's will which hath sent me, that of all which he hath given me I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day. And this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Again, a, just a, a secure promise saying, I will raise you up at the last day if you believe in me. That's what Jesus Christ was saying. So now here's a little bit of scriptural evidence to show that someone who has been saved, would not do these particular sins. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 3, says, Wherefore I give you to understand that no man speaking by the Spirit of God calleth Jesus accursed, and that no man can say that Jesus is the Lord but by the Holy Ghost. So he's saying there, you know, no man speaking by the Spirit of God called Jesus accursed, which would be, Similar to, you know, blaspheming the Holy Ghost, blaspheming the Holy, the Holy Spirit. Um, I think that's, that's a pretty good scripture there, kind of showing that, okay, well, you're not going to call Jesus a curse. I mean, if you think about it yourself personally, like, would you ever do it? I mean, you could ever think of a situation where you would just blaspheme the Holy Ghost and say that Jesus is of Satan. I mean, it, it's, it would be pretty hard to do. But how about this one, too? This, this one's even a little bit stronger, a lot, actually a lot stronger. Matthew 24, verse 24. Turn, if you would, there, Matthew 24. We're almost done. I'm wrapping it up now. Matthew 24, of course, this is um, a great passage talking about the, the end times, the end times events here in Matthew 24. Well, let's look at verse 23. It says, then if any man shall say unto thee, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. So he's, he's given us a warning in the last time, saying, look, if, if someone's saying that they're Christ, he's that, oh, Christ is here, Christ is over there, saying, don't believe him. Verse 24, it says, For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. So right there in that one statement, 
when he's talking about the Antichrist, he's talking about false Christ, false prophets, he's saying, look, they're going to come, they're going to show great signs and wonders. They're going to be doing all kinds of these miraculous types of things that are, that are going to deceive a lot of people. And he said they're going to do so much that if it were possible, meaning that it's not possible, if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. So he's saying, you are not, if you're saved, you are not going to be deceived by the false Christ, by the, by the Antichrist, in, or, in, which, in which case is when you would receive the mark of the beast. Right? He's saying, if it were possible, they'd even de deceive the very elect, even the people who are saved. But it's not possible. It's not possible for you to be deceived by that. The, you know, Jesus Christ said that you know, he's the good shepherd, and my sheep hear my voice. And Nomi said, he says, another shepherd they will not hear. There's something about being saved and, and, and having the Holy Spirit inside of you and being a child of God, having a spirit born again, that gives you this understanding. And, and, and the Bible says that you know, you're not going to be deceived by Antichrist. We simply won't. It's not something that's, that we're going to be tricked into doing. And, oh man, I was saved, but I took the mark of the beast. I, didn't, I was an idiot. You know, I just wanted to eat or whatever. Like, I mean, you think about this because if you think about these things, that that maybe that would happen because it says also that no man is able to buy or sell except he take the mark of the beast. So you say, well, I mean, what if you have a weak Christian that, that just, I mean, they just want to eat some food, right? But you notice too that that taking the mark of the beast is also tied in with worshiping him. And and you know, I don't know everything that's involved in that, but. Um, Taking the mark of the beast is also something that's used, I think, to identify who is a Christian and who isn't. Because the Christians won't be taking the mark of the beast. And that's when, when the Antichrist is going to come after them and really persecuting and, and trying to wipe out and annihilate all the Christians. And there's going to be a lot of martyrs and people who are killed for the, name, for the cause of Christ during that time. And it's going to be the people who don't take the mark of the beast. And um, anyways, from these verses... In addition to the fact that there would just there would have to be some kind of a blatant contradiction in the Bible, which we already know that there isn't, um, it, I don't believe it's possible for for a saved person. And why would a saved person, as the Holy Spirit inside of them, try to change God's word from what it says? I mean, the word that saved your soul, then going and, and modifying and trying to change it. I, I don't see that happening. I don't see that happening with any of these things. So. I mean, these unforgivable sins, I don't think it's anything you have to worry about doing in your life. Like, um, Or if you're saved today, did I ever do this? Did I ever blaspheme the Holy Ghost and not really know it? Well, no. If you, if you put your faith in Christ, just, just by virtue of the fact that you know that, that you put your faith in Christ, you understand that you've received that free gift, you, you've been forgiven of your sins. You couldn't have done an unforgivable sin in the past. So it's just, you know, it's, it's one of those things. Um, I don't know. Hopefully, it's, it's, kind of a, it's kind of a deep subject. It's kind of one of those tricky things that comes up. Hopefully, I was able to, 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 to clarify it a little bit for you. But it is important. I mean, these questions do come up. People, people have these. I, I get it from time to time out of the doors. And people are kind of asking, well, what, what does this really mean? It's unforgivable. And blaspheming all the ghosts. What is, that, what is that really all about? What does that mean? And um, I thought that Jesus forgives everyone or whatever. But... No, I mean, there, there are some things the Bible says very clearly that you can't be forgiven for. It's just, it's just important to know that, and, and people ought to take heed, you know, the things that, that you speak and the words that come out of your mouth. Because the, our words will be judged. Every idle word that, that a man shall speak, the Bible says. So um, let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you so much for the Bible. I thank you for, for teaching us. And I thank you that um, for making salvation so easy and so attainable, dear God, and that um, even though there's, there are these, these certain things that people can do to, to damn themselves, Lord, it's, it's not that much, and they're, and they're pretty extreme cases, dear God. And we thank you for being so loving and merciful towards us and for all that you have put up with us through and, and still love us enough to give us a free gift of salvation. God, help us to, to warn others. Help us to, to have the urgency when we, when we preach the gospel so that, you know, people won't, won't end up taking one of these paths and, and learning about you and rejecting you, dear God. Help us to, to 
express the urgency of the matter when we talk to people that that know this really is important and that you you, you really ought to just um, you know for these people to take their put their faith in Christ and just to get saved today as, as opposed to putting it off later dear Lord since we don't know what a day might bring and um, I, I thank you for your word I pray that you please just continue to teach us and guide us and instruct us through your word dear Lord it's in Jesus name we pray amen